into his arms. So what a great song. As you're turning back to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, one of the things that I was meditating, thinking about this week was, you know, you know, exactly what was a day in the life of Jesus, right? It's like, because when we're reading the narrative, in, in essence, we're like walking with Jesus. We're walking with the disciples. We're walking from town to town, from, from event to event, and, and place to place. And, and in, in Matthew 4, we're just at the beginning of, of, of Jesus' ministry, just, just at the start. And so one of the things that I want us to kind of anchor, at least in, in, our, in our minds, is understanding these footsteps of Jesus and understanding kind of his mentality behind it. So in Luke 9, Luke 9.51 says, And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension, this is near the end of his ministry, that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And they did it, but they did not receive him. So the, the messengers went to Jerusalem, but they weren't well received. They, they, they didn't want what they had. Because he was journeying with them, his face towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So, so again, you've got a picture. Here's Jesus, and he's walking from town to town, preaching and proclaiming the gospel. And there, he sends messengers out ahead of him because we're, we're, we're going to Auburn next. Because, you know, those no-good heathens, they, they need Jesus, right? And so we go into Auburn and, and we're rejected. And so, like the good Christians that the disciples are, the brothers come back and say, great idea, Jesus. Why don't you command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Whoa! Well, that's the context for the next two verses that we quote all the time. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. And so we quote that all the time, that the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. But it means even more coming off the backside of, of what they were just talking about. And, and, and Jesus' right-hand men are looking at Jesus saying, if they don't want it, if the world rejects it, then let's judge them. But that's not the attitude of Jesus. That's not the footsteps of Jesus. We see again later in Luke 19. Luke 19, 1 through 10. <coughs> says this, And he entered and was passing through Jericho, and behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. We know this story. And he was a chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. And he was trying to see that who Jesus was, and he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Now, we all remember that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, right? We remember that story, we sing the song, but we forget the point of the story. It's the point of the story. And he ran ahead of him, and he climbed up into the sycamore tree in order to see him, and he went about to pass through the way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for today I must stay in your house. And he hurried and came down, and he received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. So they were rebuking Jesus because he's going to talk and hang out with a sinner, a, a, a well-known sinner. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of all my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. 
And then here's our verse that we quote all the time. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. So again, in the context of these two verses, it's like, in following in Jesus' footsteps, it's not an easy path. These aren't people that are just sitting there waiting for somebody to tell, tell them about Jesus and then they're all going to you know, fall down, worship, and be baptized. It's quite the opposite. It's people who reject Jesus. It, it, it's it's a, a sinful man, Zacchaeus, and it's Jesus who, who seeks him out. I remember when I was uh, young in the faith. You know, I became a believer in my first year in college in earnest. And I was at an all-black church in South Central LA. It was a pretty well-known church, and it was a big church, and I had never been to a church that had a balcony. I had been to many churches, but I, I hadn't been to a church that had a balcony. I was like, that's cool. And so me and my roommate, who is also a, a teammate on the baseball team, we're, we're going to go up in the balcony, and this is cool. And we're, we're there, and, and we're worshiping, and the worship was, was fantastic. And, you know, but we looked around, it's like nobody else was in the, in the balcony. It's like we thought it was going to fill up, but it was just us. And when the pastor came up after the time of, of singing, he came up and was like, Hey, brothers, why don't you come on down here and join us? And I, I didn't know who Zacchaeus was at the time, but I kind of felt like Zacchaeus. <laughs> like he's calling me out. But he's seeking me out. And, and that ended up being a relationship with the pastor, and that ended up being the church that I was actually baptized in. But the point is that, that Jesus didn't come to seek uh, to, to, to destroy men's life. He, he came to seek and save the lost. You know, we just got done reading about Christmas, right? And, and the point of Jesus' birth, the point of Jesus' ministry is what? Well, it's, it's to seek and save the lost. And his example, his example, and the way he does that, the way he lives should be our example. And so it begs the question, well seek and save the lost will save from what lost from what what lost means is like you don't know where you're at right you're on the wrong path and so in matthew 3 which we studied not too long ago re remember god coronates jesus by showering him with the holy spirit at baptism now we know that jesus didn't need the forgiveness of sin but it was a representation and and Jesus was doing this obedience, but it was, a, it was showing in this great picture, this, this picture of the cleansing of sin and the, by, by the death, the burial, and the resurrection, right? The, the new life that we have as being Christians, as being followers of Christ. And so immediately from that event, immediately from Jesus being baptized, what happens next? Well, last week we studied that that Jesus then was attacked. He was attacked by the devil himself. And so the first thing that we see, the first steps after baptism, Jesus is in the wilderness. He's immediately being tempted by the devil. And remember, the devil is relentless. The, the devil is in hot pursuit. The devil is, is like a, a, a lion seeking whom he can't can destroy both physical and spiritual and we saw last week that Jesus fights off the devil how by using God's word it is written this is how he combats the Bible and so we too as we saw in James 4 17 we too can resist the devil and he will flee we also know in 1 John 4, 4 that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so we can, like Jesus' example, we can fight off the temptation of the devil. That's within us. We saw, and we're seeing now in, in, in Matthew 4, that Jesus' preaching ministry is going to be uh, launched by by the sermon that we've all remembered and, and memorized, right? I hope we've all memorized by now the great sermon of repent, right? We can all remember that, okay? Greatest sermon ever, repent. Well, today we're actually going to kind of study and look into that. Um, but now here's the thing. 
You know, and I was reading this and taking in the whole context of Matthew, like I said, and looking behind and, and, and forward and understanding kind of how the human heart works. And, and the way we are, we're like the sons of thunder, right? You love me, I'll love you. You accept Jesus, I'll accept you. You re reject Jesus, rain down fire and consume him. May it never be. May, may our hearts never, ever be that way. That is not the steps of Jesus. Our next step is wartime. We want blood. Jesus' next step says we're going to see. It's time to go fishing. Let's go fishing. And we'll talk about that. Today we're going to learn how we follow Jesus' steps. How we follow Jesus. The, the, the statement in Matthew 16, 24 is we're to follow Jesus, right? Question is how. Well, we're going to see in just a few verses here three, three ways that we can follow Jesus. First, through the message of repentance. The first way we follow Jesus is through the message of repentance. The second way we follow Jesus is through mankind by fishing. Through mankind by fishing. And then finally, we're going to look at through mercy missions. Through mercy missions. So, back to the word, back to the book. Uh, Matthew 4, 17. The first way we follow Jesus is through the message. What message? Repent. Right? Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We'll stop right there. There's a lot there, right? We already saw that Jesus' ministry is launched by the Son of Man not coming to destroy, but coming to seek and save the lost. How does he do that? What's that process? Well, he comes out of the gate with you know, this word, repent. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop living the way you're living. And in 1 John 2, 2, we see that, that he came to, to, to do a mission, right? To, to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sin, to atone. And we call that from 1 John 2.2, 2, he came to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, that has the idea in the Greek, the idea of atoning for what will be the, the appeasing sacrifice, the satisfying sacrifice. But here's the twist. For God's wrath. So, God's wrath and judgment will come unless the, the, the punishment and the wrath is appeased. And how is it appeased? Well, it's appeased by that sacrifice, which ultimately is through Jesus. And so, the message is that Jesus comes and says, repent, we're the sinners. Right? We're not perfect. We're not innocent. I hate to say it, we're not good. Uh, we're, you know, Jeremiah 17, 9, desperately sick and wicked. Romans 9 makes it clear. None's righteous, no, not one. Not you, not you, not you, not you. Not me. None of us are righteous. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? That's our state of position. So he came to save us from the wrath to come. And so his message then is repent. We want to understand what repent is. We want to understand that Without repentance, with, without grace, that there's consequences for disobedience. There's a consequence for breaking law, God's laws. Previously in Matthew 3, we studied kind of the four reasons uh, why we should repent. Maybe you're thinking, ah, I don't need to repent. I'm pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I'm better than that guy over there. Right? I know her. I'm better than her. It's not about that. It's not about how we rank each other. Uh, in, in that case, we're, we're all no good. But last time we, we looked at four reasons to repent were, remember, first, the kingdom of God is at hand. God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Are you ready right now to stand before the throne of God? The, the second consequence and reasons we should repent is with that coming of the Lord comes wrath. It's the separation of the sheep from the goats. It's, you know what? We're, we're separating. It's, it's time to pick teams here. Team Jesus or the other side. Uh, so it's time to repent. The other thing is, do you remember we talked about the axe is laid and ready? The axe is ready. 
at the root of the tree to chop it down. It's that idea of the pruning and the grafting um, from Romans. And then finally, not only is the axe ready in one hand, but the winnowing fork where you separate the wheat from the chaff is there. And so that's why we should repent just out of the, the sheer desire to, to protect ourselves from eternal hell. But even more than that, we have a response to grace. We have a response to love. So, yes, I love my dad. Still love my dad. It's not past tense. Yes, I love my dad. Yes, I fear the wrath of my dad. But even more so, what drives me to and what drove me to obey was my love for my dad. My desire to please my dad. Not that I had to earn it. He already loved me. He already made all the sacrifices for me. And so this response of repentance, let's get it out of the way, has nothing to do with earning your salvation. By repenting, you, you haven't just won salvation. You haven't just earned it. This is just a response to the grace that's already been given. The repentance then has to do with, in, in the Greek, the Greek word means to change one's mind of purpose. So it's not just a, a physical thing. You, you, just, you, you, you just don't do it, right? I mean, any military you know, drill sergeant can get the soldiers to stand up and sit down when he wants to. The idea of repentance is one that's in the heart and the mind. It, it, it's deep. The, the, the way you think is going to drive you to then live differently. Proverbs 23, 7. So a man thinketh he liveth, right? And so God wants us to, to change from the innermost being of, of the depths of our soul that, that once it changes in there, then it will, from the head to the heart to the hand, then it will change the way we actually live. We see a picture of that in Romans 12, 1, 2, through by the, by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that we will no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That, that's tied in with this idea of, of repentance, that our, our, our heart's desire, our mind and purpose is now flown to our minds, so now we're useful tools for God's glory. And that's what Jesus is preaching. That's what he's saying when he says, repent. But he also brings along with, hey, you need to repent because you're sinful and you need to change your ways. And you need to change your ways today. But also, let's not forget, I bring the kingdom of heaven with me. I bring the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's something that's not of this earth. We're too caught up in this earth. We're too caught up in the things of this earth. Our houses, our cars, our lawns, our riding lawnmowers, our hair, our jewelry, or whatever it is. We're so caught up in the things of the earth that we've forgotten the kingdom of heaven. And, and Jesus is saying, look, I'm, I'm bringing the kingdom of heaven. Our response should be, yeah, bring it. Amen. Come today. As Revelation says, come quickly. Come quickly. Right? But, but, but. We must repent. We must repent. That's the calling card of, of Jesus. That somehow in you know, 2024, we've forgotten that we're supposed to repent. Because we've been told, well, your sin's not that bad. <laughs> well, Jesus forgives everything. Right? Now, that's a presumption. It's a dangerous presumption. All who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom of God. He will say to some, depart from me, I never knew you. He will say that to pastors. He'll say that to sweet little old ladies. Okay, God desires, not works, but fruit. We'll get to this in a couple weeks. The, the, the fruit that is supposed to be showing and on display. And like I said, it, it's not that everybody's going to have like that same big old giant you know, harvest fruit tree with the biggest, juiciest, you know, pieces of fruit. Some you just got like, you know, it's just, just starting. It's just baby buds. But you got to see something, right? There should be growth. There should be something there. And so he says, look, you need to repent. By the way, I'm bringing the kingdom of heaven with me. And, and he says that it's at hand, which means what? It's, 
it's near. It's very close. It's within this distance. It's not way over there. It's not out yonder. It's not, well, I got a long, 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 long. You don't know. You don't know. A young man who I grew up with, um, went to middle school and high school with, and walked to school with, and, you know, was a neat kid. Uh, you know, he, he fell off of a cliff and died when he was 21 years old. You know, who knew? The beautiful thing is, he knew the Lord. He, he knew Jesus. And, and we'll see him again someday. But we don't know. You could be athletic, you could be in the pride of life, and it can end. So the clear message, Jesus' message, our message, our proclamation is, heaven is coming, repent. And, and it's not, you know, the, the stick. It's not about the stick. It's about the carrot, right? It's really about the carrot, but you can't understand the reward if you don't understand that, well, there, there is a punishment. We, we say this all the time, that, that the good news, the only way to understand the good news, you have to understand that there's bad news. The bad news for unrepentant sin is an eternity in hell. So, we must follow Jesus by repenting. <clears throat> well, the second way we follow Jesus' steps and, and I love this, this passage, is through mankind by fishing. Because it really, again, speaks back to the, to the Luke you know, passages of Jesus not coming to, to destroy, but seeking, saving the lost. And we see this in this, this beautiful picture. Uh, verse 18. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The profession is catching fish. They know it upside down, inside and out. They know everything there is to know about fishing. That's what they do. They do it every day. They do it all day. And Jesus says, forget the fish. I'll make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him and going on from there, he saw two brothers, James and the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. Well, Jesus says to these guys, and now what we see here is Jesus starting to gather the disciples. He's gathering his team. And his team weren't a bunch of, you know, uh, Bible scholars, they weren't a bunch of guys who had, were, you know, in devotion to the Lord, you know, in the desert. No, these were just rugged fishermen. Fishermen was a rugged industry. It's one of my favorite things of... Fishermen was a rugged industry. It's one of my favorite things of, you know, moving to Seattle and actually <clears throat> I had seen the guys, the throwing fish guys in a training video uh, when I was living in California, got shipped to Tennessee, saw a video about the guys in Seattle, right? And then we move here, and you finally get to see the flying fish guys. And it's like, and everybody's talking about them. Everybody loves them. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. It's like, but do you know what they do? They get up at 4 in the morning. It's freezing cold. Chances are it's raining. It's Seattle. Their hands are freezing because they're packing in ice. And... At the end of the day, and I'm guessing all day long, forever, they smell like fish. <laughs> and we sit here and go, man, that's the coolest job ever. No, not cool. Really, really hard work. That's the life of a fisherman. And so the, this is who Jesus calls. He doesn't call the professionals. He calls, as the book says, 12 ordinary men, people like you and me. And so he says, follow me. Great statement, especially coming out of the first passages of Matthew chapter 4, because Jesus just got done doing battle with the devil, who in essence tells Jesus, follow me, right? That's the, the temptation that the devil is laying before Jesus' feet. In, in Matthew 4, 9, the devil says, all these things <clears throat> I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. No, he didn't start that way, right? He started with, oh, you're, you've been fasting for 40 days, you're hungry, let me give you some bread. Nothing wrong with bread. 
Well, what could be wrong with the bread? What could be wrong with a little, a little fruit, Eve? Right? See how the devil operates? Then, then the devil offers him like the whole city, takes him up to the, to the temple and says, look, here, here's the city. I'll, I'll give this to you. But all of these are, are really ruses just to get Jesus to ultimately serve his master, the devil. It's the master who gives the, the bread. It's the master who gives the, the crowns. It's the master who gives the world, right? And the devil's trying to get Jesus. He's trying to entice Jesus to follow him. Now, look, the Bible's clear for, you know, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Don't love the world or the ways of the world. And yet we're like in a vortex getting sucked into the world closer and closer every day. And the danger is, are we so deep? Are we so in there that we, we can't even get out? Well, we're told not to do that. We're told to follow Jesus. What does that mean? That means we serve one master, our master. We can't serve two masters. There's only one way to the Father. That's through the Son, Jesus. That's by following Jesus. What does following Jesus mean? It means following his footsteps. Well, it begins with repentance, but it also includes not just about you. It's not just about you being a good person and repenting and, you know, shine, being the shining star in the room. But there's this other piece and component that Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. We want more. We're still recruiting. You know, I love college football and a big piece of college football is, you know, you've got to recruit. You know, so they, they, the best you can be is you know, like a five-star guy. Then they have four stars, three stars. Uh, my team doesn't recruit anything lower than a three-star, so we won't talk about them. But it's like you, you're, you're always recruiting every day, all day long. I remember when USC won the national championship, and it's like, you know, they asked Pete what he did that night, and he's like, he was on the phone recruiting, getting more guys, loading up. Well, Jesus is still recruiting. He still wants, okay, great, we're here, and, and, and we've been saved, and we love Jesus. You know what he's saying? Go get more. Um, my, my mansion is filled with many houses, many rooms. I, I've got more. I've got more treasure. I've got more heaven. It's at hand. It's coming. Guys, go be fishers of men. Go get more. It's not just about you. And so we live by the credo of Philippians 2, do nothing from selfishness or, or empty conceit, but the humility of mind, regard others as more important than yourself. Well, part of that is wanting them to be saved. We don't want anybody to die in destruction. Yes, even the politicians. Yes, even the crazies on the street, right? No, we, 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 we want them to repent and be saved. That's our prayer. You see them on TV or your feed. You get angry. Your little vein pops out of your neck and your forehead. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for their souls. Well, the fishing process, though, look, it's fun. And, you know, most of the guys in here like to fish and maybe some of the gals. But, but it's not easy. Fishing is fun, but it's not easy. They've even got the, you know, the, the crazy gooey duck things. You know, I, you know, they're so gross and disgusting and you got to get up early and drive far. And, but there's a reward for it and it's fun. It's part of the fishing experience. Well, what is the fishing process? And as I was thinking about it, it's like, okay, so normally, you know, we got to go out and we got to, you know, they make us get a fishing license, right? It's like the government's got to find a way to, you know, chisel out a couple bucks from us and then limit us. You know, you got to, I got a river in my backyard and it's like, well, you can only fish in it for like, you know, three days a year. And, you know, you got to have like a, not a, you know, a, a single hook that's more like a toothpick. And, you know, if you're able to catch, you know, then you got to release it and it's like, Oh, but, you know, have fun. Um, so, you know, there's these restrictions. Well, we don't have any restrictions. We live in America. Yeah, I know we've got problems in America, but we can preach the gospel openly. We can. We can tell people about Jesus. We don't, we don't need a license. Our license is God's word that, that says, go, make disciples. Our license comes from the Lord God Almighty himself. We don't need a seminary degree. I'm blessed and thankful that I was able to go to seminary, but you don't need a seminary degree to 
repeat his message, repent, and then tell him about how he's helped your life, right? You, you don't need a degree for that. We, we understand that in fishing, there, there, there comes a knowledge. You know, I'm, I'm still learning fishing and, you know, I talk to other people who know how to fly fish and know how to stream fish and know how to do different things. And, and I learn and grow and glean from, from other people who already have knowledge. Maybe they've read books. They've been doing it for a long time. But, but we need to continue to, to, to learn and grow. And we learn and grow from the word of God. Right? All scripture is profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. And so for us to fish for men, we have to have a, 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 a knowledge from the word of God. You don't have to memorize everybody else's religion. Know your religion, and, and that will help you to rebuke the others. <clears throat> well, it helps when you fish to, to know the right place, right? I got a sweet spot. I got a place that... You know, the fish are jumping. Well, you know what? We need to identify the, the right time and, and the right place here too. You know, yes, you love Johnny, you know, at the, you know, at the register who's checking you out, you know, for groceries and all that. But when there's a line of 10 people behind you and, you know, that's probably not the time to lay out the 10 minute gospel. Okay. There's a time and a place, a time and a place. We get offended but maybe we, we need to learn to have some feel, right? There's a better opportunity, a better place. And then you go to the right spot and the fish jump. They hop on your real easy like, right? So maybe we have to evaluate the places and the way we're doing it. We have these things called rods, you know, what, what does the rod do? The rod helps us to extend out to, to just have that, that extra reach. So again, our goal is not to have like this little holy huddle. Or it's just like, all right, here's our group. We all love Jesus. Everybody get in tight. Ready? Break. No, that's not the goal. Our, our goal is to, like a rod, extend out, outreach, right? That's the, the goal of being a fisher of men. We have, you know, reels and the reel, it, it controls, right? We can, we can let some out. We can pull it in. We can pull it in tighter. Okay, there's... there's uh, uh, there's give some line, give some space. Again, we, you can't just have like one approach to, to fishing for the souls of men. You can't have just one approach to your, your evangelism. Um, again, have some different ways, some different methods. I think of the line for fishing and the, the fishing line allows us to go real far, right? You go like, you know, fly fishing and you throw it out there and then it just goes down the stream, right? It's like, well, how far will it go? It goes far enough to run out of my reel. It's like, it goes pretty far. And that, that allows you to go beyond the reach that you could even conceive. Makes me think spiritually of fishing for a minute. It's like, you know, we can be creative. We can be a little unique. It doesn't have to like only happen in church. Right? There's other ways we can send out our line. There's other ways that we can preach the gospel. But we should be on, uh, on the search for fishing, being fishers of men, seeking and saving the lost should be part of our mission. We have bait. Now, not bait like, you know, the used car salesman. We're, we're not trying to trick people. Right? We, we have bait. Bait attracts. It, it lures in. And we, we, our bait is we, we want to have the love of Christ. We want to be winsome. We, we don't win people, you know, win their souls by yelling at them and pointing fingers and attacking and getting political. That, that's not how you win souls. Again, our example is Jesus. Yes, Jesus came with the word of, hey, you need to repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is coming and I want you to go to heaven with me. See, see how we use that together? So it's not just, you know, one way or the other. We, we, we don't want to be odious. Oh, one of those Christians. Hey, we have to fight against that, right? Our brothers and sisters in Christ out there have made a lot of mistakes. We've made a lot of mistakes. I've made mistakes. Okay, we're fighting against just kind of a, oh, Christians hate non-believers. Christians are judgmental, right? Well, we work against that with different bait, different ways, methods, approaches. Some use apologetics. Some use just straight love. Some are storytellers. Some 
get personal. Let me tell you about my personal story. We have different ways to attract people. And then I was thinking of the concept of the cooler. You know, why do you have a cooler? Because if, you know, you are lucky and you get to keep the fish that you just caught and you would like to preserve them and keep them and save them for later, right? Well, it reminds me of like, we have so many drive-by evangelists these days. You know, drive-by sermons, drive-by podcasts. And it's like, you know, are people just driving by and quickly shoot out the gospel and try to get you to say anything to say, okay, I accept Jesus. I don't care how they get you to do that. Just that you like say the magic words. And it's like, you're in and then they're gone. It's like, no, you, we, we got to put them in the cooler. We got we to gotta sustain them. We got to be with them. We got to comfort them and encourage them. And it's a process of a discipleship. And the point is to preserve and to continue preserving, right? Otherwise, we've just did a drive-by and two months later, they're right back where they were because we didn't do anything to, you know, keep them cool. I think of the vests, you know, got to have a cool vest when you're fishing, right? Because, you know, now you need all these things. You need, if you're like me, you need extra lures because you're always breaking and losing them and, you know, that kind of extra hooks, all that stuff. But all these little vests and all these little holes and spaces and dangling things and, you know, well, why? It, that, that's your preparation. You're trying, you're in the middle, you know, I like to fish in the middle of the river. And so it's like, well, I, you know, now to get out of the river and go back to the, to the shed and, and, you know, get another lure is going to be a hassle. So it'd be nice if I just had it right here in my pocket or a little, you know, nail clip over here to, to cut and a knife here and, you know, maybe a club or a basket there. So you got all this stuff, you know, you're just dangling in there. <laughs> but you take all these things because you want to be prepared. We can be prepared to be fishers of men. You know your neighbor next door. You know how he ticks. You know the best time and place. And be prepared to talk to him. You, you know your coworker. You know how they are. You know you generally only get like 60 seconds of conversation. Be prepared for that. You know, read some books. Have some tracks. Listen to some podcasts. You know, invite them to church. There's different ways that we can be prepared. But we got to be prepared. Have your vest ready to go. And then ultimately in fishing for men and fishing in general is patience, 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 right? The idea of being prepared to suffer long, to long suffering patience. The process is long. Again, we're not used car salesmen. It, 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 we're, we're, you know, presenting the gospel. When we listen to testimonies, very rarely is it like, you know, uh, I was walking down the road and I'd never heard the name of Jesus before. And somebody said Jesus's name and I fell down and worshiped. How many testimonies have you heard like that? It just doesn't happen. It's like, oh, I grew up and I, I knew something about the Lord. And, and I even grew up in the church and then I went away. And then some guy named Rick told me about Jesus. And then three years later, it's, it's a process. That's why some people call it you know, a faith journey, right? It's a long journey. Be patient in that process. One of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7. Some plant, some water. It's God who causes the growth. I love that we all want to reap harvest. We all want to reap the harvest, right? But you know what? For some, that's not your job. Your job is to plant the seed, plant the seed, plant the seed. We can't just be results oriented. This isn't sales, okay? Some plant, you're the planter. Go plant seeds, toss seed, toss seed out as much as you can possibly toss the seed out. And then there's somebody else who comes along and, you know, they water. They water and somebody else comes along and cultivates and somebody else comes along. We all have a piece and a role in this. But at the end of the day, you don't save anybody. I don't save anybody. It's God who causes the growth. That should take away all the pressure, all the pressure, all the anxiety, all the angst to make it happen today. It's not on you. It's not on you. It's on you to love them. It's on you to, to, to preach, but it's not on you to, to have the final victory. 
2 Peter 3 9 is one of those verses that are, you know everybody debates over, you know, it's a you know Calvinism, Arminianism debate. And it's like don't look at it that way. Look at it. I, I think the reason, the main reason why it's there is so that we can see God's real heart's desire in 2 Peter 3 9 is that if it be his will, all would be saved. God's great desire is that every single person on the planet would fall down and worship and follow him. He provides the method by sending his son. He provides the method of God incarnate walking the face of the earth and then dying on the cross, paying the price for our sins. He didn't do that for because it was his desire of only some for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. That was his desire. That's his heart's desire. But not everybody follows. If not everybody follows, it should at least give us kind of the collective sigh of, you know what? I, I'm not going to like, everybody's not going to accept Jesus that I plant or water or, you know, I'm there to cultivate. And I might not even be there when they're, harvest comes and that's okay that's okay just as long as i can be part of the process well finally the third the first step we follow jesus is through mercy missions so so we're fishing for men and he, here's another kind of example of how we do that in another method it's it's through mercy missions what's a mercy mission verse 23 and jesus was going about in all galilee teaching in their synagogues so Jesus goes and he, he, the first step and the first platform is going to the synagogues and, and, and teaching God's word and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases, pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them, and great multitudes followed him in Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So I was thinking about this, and, and right now, you know, you go on your feed or you go on YouTube and you see these pictures, right? And you see like thousands of people strolling through Mexico, caravanning into America, right? And it's like, whoa, that's wild that's crazy but when you think about it a different way on the other side of the barbed wire fence in the rio grande river is jesus and he's healing everybody sickness disease epilepsy do you think the line would be as long as the line that we're seeing right now i mean i don't even know what this line is like i can't even picture it all i know is that if i knew that there was jesus and he's healing I would be like the, the you know, in, in Mark, the they guys that pick up their buddy on a pallet and carry them to Jesus. How big is this line? What does this line look like? And it's not just to like, you know, come into America. This line is go see Jesus. And Jesus is healing them. Bam, 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 bam. I mean, he's performing the miraculous. You know, we, 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 we begin here with he's going out into all Galilee and he's, he's teaching. Okay, so, so it's not just the touchy-feely stuff. He's not just giving away free gifts. He, he's preaching. He's teaching in the synagogues. Preaching what? The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's telling it like it is. You need to repent for the kingdom of God is coming. There's a heaven. There's a hell. I mean, he's laying it on there. He is bringing the gospel with him. Yes, preach, preach repentance. Yes, preach obedience. Yes, there's consequences and wages for disobedience of sin. But remember, God loved us and sent us his son. And his son comes not only, verse 23, to proclaim the gospel, but to have a little heart too. Do we have heart? Do we have compassion or is it just left us? And so make sure you understand this clearly. We're not just like do-gooders. 
We don't just like give food to the, to the local rescue mission. You know, I, I spent time at Seattle's Union Gospel Mission and, and, and I loved the idea of the ministry and I loved that the people there were trying to proclaim and teach the gospel. But you got to be very, very careful that you don't just become just a free food truck because now you're just enabling people to continue on their sin. That's not what Jesus shows here. What he shows is, look, I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach. I'm going to say it how it is. You need to repent and I'll give you food, clothing and shelter. But it's not just food, clothing, and shelter. And that's where we've gotten a little off track. We think that, well, if I go and there's a, a, a cross on the sign of the van and I give food, clothing, and shelter out of the back of the truck, then I've proclaimed the gospel. Not exactly. You've shown some love of Christ. I, I don't want to take that away. But, but notice here, it's both. It's both. On the flip side, it's not just preaching the gospel. It's also showing some love and compassion. And so from this, we see that, that Jesus performs the miraculous. Jesus performs the supernatural. But what can we do? Well, first, Romans 1.16, we know that the gospel has the power unto salvation. So, so by using this food, clothing, shelter to preach the gospel, that has that power of salvation, Right? We know that, John, that, that again, Jesus in, in John 8, not only does, does he heal, not only does he relieve people from the demonic, but, it, but it, he reminds them, and go and sin no more, right? It's not just, here's a sandwich, have a good day, uh, and go and sin no more. Well, there's got to be a, a, a fuller message that goes with that. I, I want you guys to understand that when we talk about this idea of through mercy missions, it's the idea of being like missional, right? Well, the gospel itself, the gospel, the word the gospel, again, coming from the Greek, uh, evangelion, which is to evangelize, which is the gospel. The gospels to evangelize. Evangelism is the gospel, is the good news. You guys see how it's, they're all the same. So preaching the good news is evangelizing. It is the gospel. And we can use mercy missions to preach the gospel. How so? There was a great book that I, I read a long time ago called, uh, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? What if Jesus had never been born? If Jesus had never been born, then the YMCA, Young Men Christian Association, that was housing you know, young men who didn't have you know, housing, that never would have been created. If there was no Jesus, then, then the Red Cross, who said, you know what, we're going to go in the middle of the battlefield and help both sides who are injured. All that was because of a love of Christ. Because of a love for Jesus, missions all over the world that are helping you know, the poor, the widow, orphan, poor, the homeless, with food, clothing, and shelter. All that driven for, that's why they're called missions. Rescue missions. All fueled by the love of Christ. All our early, all our early um, uh, hospitals and schools. Everything that we see that's good around was driven by a mercy mission led by a love for Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing. I think of the, you know, the cleft palates of people in Africa or hydration or, or, or uh, midwives. All of that, again, are, are missions that are propelled by a love for Christ that comes with a mercy mission and the gospel. And the gospel. So... Just as a reminder, remember, all of this is given by grace. None of this is an earned thing. We, we got to remember that. We didn't earn it, neither will they. So we can have some mercy and compassion for others because you know what? We didn't earn it either. And so it's given by grace means it's unearned. Didn't require repentance. It was just driven by the compassion of God. He is our example. We follow his steps. It's that old story of the police and the paramedic, right? You get in a big old car accident at four corners over here. And at four corners, there's a car accident. And, and, and who comes on the scene? The police and the paramedic. Well, well, who are you? The policeman comes and says, okay, I'm, I'm getting all the information to find out who is at fault. Who did the wrong thing? Who needs to be punished? Who needs to go to jail? 
He has a job. He has a mission. That's his responsibility, and it's good, and we need him. But we also have a paramedic who comes on the scene. I don't care how or why you got in a car accident. I just see two people with gashing wounds and are injured. I'm going to help them both. It's not a matter of, well, well it was your fault, so I'm going to help them first, right? So, so you, you got to understand, well, who are you? Are you just like that legalistic policeman reciting, quoting Bible and law and debating over theology and doctrine? Or are you a paramedic where you're just trying to seek and save the lost and trying to help other people? Well, when we follow Jesus, when we follow Jesus through mercy missions, I, I, I challenge you to think about what that looks like for you. It's not the same. We, we all have different things that, you know, we like, you know, I like the inner city and I liked, you know, the, you know, dealing with, you know, ex gang members and stuff like that, but that might not be your thing. You, you like other stuff. Great. But like Paul said, Paul's made a great statement. Follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what I would say. You know, we have heroes of the faith. You know, we have pastors. We're not called to follow those people. We're actually called to follow Christ. And, and, and we have to ask ourselves, well, what does that look like? What does it look like? It, it, it's through his simple message. Follow Christ by understanding the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of life. Look, I don't know everything there is to know about you. All I know that th this, it's got to change, right? You know that. You, you got to stop doing this. Um, you know, we, we do it through his, his love of mankind that like, you know what, I'm actually, I don't just look at these people and go, well, I'm not going to say anything. Who cares? Let them rot. Let them go to hell. Uh, they vote in the wrong party anyway, so they deserve what they get. No, I'm, I'm, we're, we're fishing for souls. That's what Jesus would do. And then we find ways and we seek ways through a relentless. The devil is relentless in his pursuit to steal souls. Are we relentless in our pursuit to save souls. If, if this is the line and this is the enemy, you shouldn't be doing what the enemy does, loving the world and doing the exact same thing the world does. You, you're, you should be reflecting the opposite. He's seeking to destroy. We should be seeking to save. A relentless compassion to being merciful, but not just to be merciful, but to preach Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Thank you for your compassion for us, your mercy on us, you seeking and saving us. What a, what a gift, what love, what kind of love is this? Lord, that you would so desire to graft us in to the tree of life, to, to make us joint heirs lord this this love of yours just never ends and we're so thankful and we're thankful lord that it's not limited to a number lord that we can go out and get more get more get more and so help us to be uh, the type of, of 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 believers or that are not just looking to grow ourselves spiritually but also looking to help others we pray this in jesus name amen